Oh, come on, somebody give Jesus a hand clap of praise in the room. Oh, come on, make noise like Jesus is Lord. Make him feel comfortable here. A little bit louder, Destiny Global. I need you to make noise like you own the region. Come on, make some noise in this room. Make noise like Jesus is Lord. All the other names fade away. There is no God like There's no God like Jehovah. No God like our God. No authority like His authority. He is still King of Kings. Oh, come on, reach in your belly. He is still Lord of Lords. No, there is no rival. There is no equal. There is no contestant. He is God all by himself. Hallelujah. We are, come on, a little bit further. Open up your spirit tonight. I know you got sound coming out of your mouth, but I need some history to come out of your belly. Raise up your voice and give him glory. Let him most have Oh, we came to do work tonight. I don't know if you got on the right amount of stamina, but you better shake yourself. I came on assignment from God to stretch the intercessory matrix of this house. And we didn't come to be cute. We didn't come to play games. It's Friday. You could be home with your feet up. But we came to put in work for the history, for the DNA, for the call, for the purpose. And what I sense in the realm of the spirit is that some of you have gotten comfortable with Richmond and you've forgotten the global mandate of this house. Every time we gather on a Friday and every time we gather on a Sunday, we're not gathering for Richmond, Virginia alone. We're gathering for the global mandate of Destiny Global Church where she is and everywhere she will be. You've got to find some intercessory prowess and push for more than this city. Push for the assignment. Push for the call. Push for the house. Push for the mission. Open up your mouth and cry out. That's what we came to do tonight. That's the reason we're here tonight. Oh, come on, let's step all the way in. And I serve notice to every lid and every limit, every cap, every barrier that's trying to keep Destiny Global confined to Richmond, Virginia. I declare tonight we bombard the heavens. Today I saw her. day so and we break, 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 break. Oh, come on. Open up your mouth. Let's break it to another level. Let's break it to another realm. Let's break it to another dimension. I need Destiny Global Church. Remember your global mandate. Remember your global assignment. Remember your impact to the nations. Open up your belly and let's break forth tonight. The breaker sat out. Oh yeah. The breaker. The breaker. The breaker. The breaker. The breaker. The breaker. The breaker is here. Another level. Another dimension. I came tonight on apostolic assignment to hold up the arms of your leaders. And while they're away fulfilling their purpose, we're going to take care of this house. I need you to open up your spirit. Open up your belly. Open up your memory. Open up your DNA. Open up your history. Open your impartation. Destiny Global Church, we've got work to do open your mouth and cry out tonight I feel like we need to leave this room and we need to move into the DNA of destiny global we need to move into the nation tonight we need to move into other territory you need to shake your belly until the lid and the limit and the cap breaks out of your spirit command the spirit of familiarity to break the spirit of commonality to break I command it right now in the name of Jesus break 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 oh come on oh come on oh come on destiny global oh come on destiny
destiny global where is your belly where is your history where is that dna i declare in the name of jesus where we have been hindered where there's been interference where there's been demonic dams standing in the way of us moving to our next level after tonight we will not live in potential but we are moving out of potential and we are laying claim on what god has promised to us Take 60 seconds, open up your mouth and pray in the Holy Ghost, come on. Oh, come on. And also, and the and then I'm not so taba, and they all say, Ninto, Par, El No Saka, and then a day, SB, Briso, Belfet, and Mampodo, and they all said, Rebea, Leto, Seter, Dino Skataya, come on, pray, 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 pray. Shake your belly and pray. Yes, yes, even where it had been lethargy and complacency. Oh, yeah, over the region called Richmond. No, even the St. Call Virginia. Tonight, we confront you by the powers of apostolic confrontation. You will not smother, you will not choke, you will not grip, you will not bind, you will not confine the assignment and the anointing that is on this house we break 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 all right do me a favor i gotta preach find yourself near a wall find yourself near a doorpost and just start pushing in the realm of the spirit come on push 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 Push! Stretch this room. Stretch this capacity. Push destiny global. Further. 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 That ain't enough. That's not enough. That's not enough. That's not further, further, further. Push until the region opens again. Push until a contraction hits your belly. Come on. Yeah. 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 Come on, push, push, push. We're almost where we need to be. Come on, push, push, push. Labor like a contraction hits your side. And when you get tired, breathe and cry again. Come on, push. Where are the wailing women? Where are the groaning men? I need destiny to get your sound back. Get your DNA back. Get your hips to cut out bush. I find the spirit of laziness. Laziness in leadership. Laziness in membership. Laziness in perspective. Oh, push. You ain't hit nothing yet. Push, I said. I said push. Push until it breaks. We're a global movement. A global house, a global stronghold, a global infrastructure. And the familiarity of Richmond will not put a lid on what we've been called to do. You push where you are, find another wall and push again. Find you another wall and keep pushing. Find you another post and keep pushing. Push until something rips. Push until something tears. Push until heaven snatches our potential open. We've been in a series on prayer. This is our last installment on that series. I hope you didn't come to look tonight. I hope you came to put the impartation to work. Grab your belly and cry out. Cry out! Cry out!
Come on, church. I feel a ladder in this room. I feel a ladder in this room. I feel a ladder. Say, what, what? Come on, that's the one. Satata, say, Pasta, Sepea, Kisolepeta, Sapanto, Pea, Kisea. Oh, I feel a ladder. I see the angels of the Lord. Let this second. Soda, Yepe, Real Casoca, Rife Berepe, Yerebon de Lepe, Catapa. Cry out! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Jesus is that ladder! Jesus is that ladder! Jesus is that ladder! Jesus is that ladder! I said, open up your mouth and cry out! And breathe and cry again. Breathe and cry again. We're almost there, church. A little bit more labor. Come on. In the hold on. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost right here. Let's go. That ladder is still active. I see the angels of the Lord. Come on and make a deposit in the history of the house. seconds just travail right there come on descend and ascend descend and ascend descend and ascend descend and ascend to leave tonight without giving birth to the next level if we're going to close this season we need to give birth to everything it put inside of us so we're going to return to this place in a few moments some of you just started coming to church And you forgot that every time you came here, it was a training center preparing you for the global assignment of this house. And while your footprint may never touch international soil, while you are deposited and invested by heaven into the mountain of your assignment, every person and people group you meet is impacted by the global responsibility of this house. Lay your hands on yourself and say, I am apostolic. Tonight we are here because there is but one God, one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Jesus who is the very Christ of God. I want to take a moment and honor the Lord for the apostles of this house. My brother and my sister, come on, let's honor the Lord for Apostle Dwayne and Apostle Cheryl Whitehead. Oh, come on, let's honor them in their absence. of our pastors. Pastor Martise, it's good to see you, man, as always. To all of our pastors, all of our leaders, Elder Siler, good to see you, man of God. To, uh, let me say the right thing. To the elder designate, 
Elder designate, we honor the Lord for you, for the company of prophets. Come on, let's clap for our leaders, for our worship pastor. We honor the Lord for you, everybody in your respected places. We thank God for the presence of God and all that he's going to do tonight. My sons are here. I love y'all so much. They just drove two hours to be here. Come on, y'all can clap for them. Was that two hours or three hours? Two and a half. All right. All right, grab those Bibles. Let's go to the Word of God. While you're turning there, I was saying it while we were up earlier, but I want you to hear me. I'm here tonight on an assignment apostolically to stretch the matrix. I like your hair, Bryson. Uh, to stretch the matrix and the womb of intercession for this house. To remind you of the mandate that this house has outside of this church, this people, this building. To remind you of your regional and thus your global international responsibility. That's the goal of heaven tonight. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter number 7. Second Chronicles chapter number 7. If you see Corinthians and you think Chronicles and Corinthians look like you are in the wrong place, praise the name of our God. Second Chronicles chapter number 7 and verse number 12. It reads like this. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have, let the church say, chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now, let the church say now, have I chosen and sanctified, let the church say this house, that my name may be there forever. And mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. I want to talk to you for the next few moments with this subject matter in mind. And once I say it, I just want you to scream it out as loud as you can. Say the word if. 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 Take your seats. And we'll discover the heart and the mind of God tonight. My subject matter is if. And my case subject or my complimentary subject is responsible for the region. You are a part of an apostolic house. And being connected to an apostolic house comes with standards, mandates, pressures, instructions, and complexities that supersede the responsibility of the generic, abundant life, superficial Christianity. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, reveals the introduction of the ascension gifts by title, but the Gospels reveal them first embodied in a man, Jesus. Thusly, any person that comes in contact with Jesus, the man, comes in contact with the embodiment of all of the gifts of Ephesians 4. So every person that has confessed Jesus as Lord is innately apostolic. 
They are innately prophetic. They are innately evangelistic. They are innately pastoral. They are innately didactic. Now, that is the nature of the believer. However, when you are a part of an apostolic house, the difference between what is in an apostolic house and the regular believer is that apostolicity becomes the armament and the weaponry of those that are connected to a house led by apostles. Does that make sense? So the assignment, the weight, the pressure, the complexity of the assignment is different. You are connected to an apostolic house whose leaders are set as apostles in the body. And your, your apostolicity is no longer, listen to this, your apostolicity is no longer salvific alone. It becomes a part of the essence and the nature of who you are in everything that you do. The reason this is important to understand is because coming into contact with apostolic ministry is going to cause there to be several levels and several different versions of life augmentation. One of the first areas that's going to come under fire, and, and, and if you're really connected to this house, I know you have a testimony of this. Uh, one of the first levels and the first layers that's going to come under fire when you connect to an apostolic house and apostolic leaders is your identity is going to come under fire. Who you thought you were five seasons ago is now challenged and checked. Why? Because your DNA, your makeup, your personhood now is on the table and now it needs to be surveilled and it needs to be surveyed to understand who you really are and what you really carry. To that end, when you come in contact with apostolic ministry and your identity comes under a microscopic lens, you have to change your vantage point and your viewpoint. Now, the reason this is important for you to understand, um, and, and, and this is no shade to nobody. I don't, I don't know no churches here other than New Canaan and Destiny Global, all right? So, so if you go to Reverend Pharaoh's church down the road, they'll come in on a Sunday morning and tell you he died every week, and that's your joy for the rest of the week. One of the forsaken realities of the local assembly, Elder, I'm about to mess up here. This is going to be unpopular. But one of the forsaken realities about the local assembly is it's not about your personal advancement. I know, we preach it like that. We preach that coming to church on Sunday morning, Mish, is about getting your word and getting what you need. And I had a bad week and, and I had a bad month. And, and so I come on Friday and I come on Team Sunday because I need to get something, because I need to hear something, and maybe somebody will prophesy to me. When the New Testament design of the local assembly was to empower you to go and expand and spread the kingdom in the places that you were called, somebody shout, prove it. I'm glad you asked me to do that because when we look at the model of the Ephesians 4 gifts, they were not to battle your depression with you. They were not to minister to your individual deficiencies. That's why you have elders and deacons to minister to you on a devotional level and on a life-on-life -life level. The responsibility of the gifts of Ephesians 4, watch me, is to equip the saints. And we can't equip you if we got to coddle you and pat you on your back and burp you every time you get offended. The responsibility of the apostolic, the responsibility of the prophetic was not to prophesy you out of your emotions. It was to equip you so that you can go back to the place you're a sign and take that mountain and claim it on behalf of your king so you are set apart Woo! you are different and because you are your dna is different and everything about you is different so your perspective about who you are has to be bigger than where you are as an apostolic house, as an apostolic leader connected to two great apostles, you've got to understand that everything you do is bigger than you. Do me a favor. Lay hands on yourself and say it's bigger than you. No, no, I know you're saying that right now because we're in church and I told you to. But I need you to embrace that reality as one of the mantras of your life. Lay hands on yourself again and say it's bigger than you. Now you hear that right now because we're in church but one of the understandings you need to uh, internalize is this is that if it's bigger than you then that includes everything. What am I trying to say? Even your warfare that you experience personally is bigger than you. This warfare and the attack it's not about you on your own. It's not about you individually. What hell is trying to do on you and throw after you and send after you is to get you distracted from the tapestry 
victory and the assignment and the destiny of the house so that if hell can get you distracted then the house has to stop uh, uh, talk to me uh, hell ha- the church has to stop to deal with where you are and what you got going on because now if you are out of place you can't fulfill your assignment now everybody's got to deal with your attitude everybody's got to deal with your distractions everybody's got to deal with the fact that you're not focused and hell's not coming after you for you alone but you're a part of an apostolic house and your distraction is derailment for the house I'm a part of an apostolic house. I'm a part of an apostolic people. And because I am, it's bigger than me. And so now you've got to see not only yourself, but the house you're connected to as bigger than where we are right now. One of the things you've got to understand, again, on on an augmentation level and on an apostolic front, is if you look uh, specifically at the leaders of this house, if you look at Apostle Dwayne and Apostle Cheryl and you notice what they do, listen to me. Them, their secular careers then you get language for one of the places and the areas that the devil is going to send attacks and warfare against the house not only the house but your house as well not only your house this house but their house as well both of them are established as apostolic principalities in finance and so one of the ways the devil is going to want to challenge the people of this house is financially but you can't see that because you're worried about somebody who didn't speak to you as an apostolic people it's bigger than us and so it's got to be bigger than Richmond it's got to include Richmond it's got to include Virginia it's got to include your zip code your area code your county your state your nation it's got to be everything somebody shout it's bigger than me and the reason apostolic ministry confronts your perspective concerning your identity is because apostolic ministry, listen to this, increases your responsibility. So if your perspective about who you are on an identity level is shy and weak and timid and bashful and I don't need a microphone I know it I understand I don't need a microphone I don't want to preach I don't need to be before people if you allow hell to mentor you into the silence of your gift and your assignment what you will do is say who I am apostolically can hide it can go unnoticed it can go unused because your perspective of your identity is small You are bigger than your preferences. I feel like I need to put some pressure right here. You are bigger than your comfort. You are bigger than your desire. And whether you like doing it or not, if you call to do it, you got to crucify your preference to get the job done. Who you are connected to an apostolic house is bigger than your comfort. And bigger than your preference. So again, if your perspective about who you are, where you are, and why you are is weak and bashful, then your assignment will submit to the weakness of how you see yourself. And the first leg of this journey in a conversation about identity and perspectives is going to be a conversation about sonship. Sonship is the engine that empowers the believer's authority. We don't cast out devils because we went to demonology one-on-one. We cast out devils because we're sons of God. Now, you don't know it. I almost ran smooth through that wall. We don't lay hands on the sick because people are sick. Bump sickness and disease. The reason I could confront sickness is because I'm a son of God. The basement, the substratum, the the foundation of the function of who I am, it's not in my gift or my skill. It's in the fact that I am a son of God. And the seven mountains are filled with successful people. But when a son of God occupies the mountain of their call and their pervasive nature, then the kingdom descends in dominion. Take a deep breath. That's why you can't hate your job. That's why you can't hate your co-workers. Because the mountain of your establishment is for the season you're in. And on that mountain, you represent the kingdom of God, especially being connected to an apostolic house. That's if you work at McDonald's or if you work at the bank. That's if you work at Wawa. I love Wawa. We didn't have Wawa in Chicago, praise God. That's if you work at Wawa or Walmart. It doesn't matter where you are, where you work, what you've got going on. You've got to love the place of your seasonal establishment because it's there that you cause the kingdom of God to advance. So... One of the substructural realities of your apostolicity is this. You are a representative of the God of your salvation. 
But if, watch me, take a deep breath. If your perspective is infected by your insecurity, then your assignment is going to see itself or your assignment is going to manifest itself through the lens of how you feel about you. Woo, I said, if you've got an assignment and you're connected to an apostolic house, it's going to be your insecurity that will infect your assignment. It is going to be how you feel about you and what you don't have and what you didn't get growing up and who was there and who was not there and who was left and who came and who stayed. All of that is now going to become a contaminant to your assignment. But the truth of the matter is this, is if your perspective is infected by your insecurity, watch me you'll think you deserve a bad day let me make it make sense the reason your insecurity infects your perspective is because the goal of that insecurity is to make you lower your guard lower your focus lower your intentionality so that you forget when you go to work you're not a representative of yourself you're a representative of the mandate of God that called you so when you get to work just because you ran out of gas on your way into work you feel like that allows you to have a bad day absolutely not no matter if you got gas in your car, food in your fridge, money in your cash app. You are a representative of a deity and you don't have a right to your own idea. Oh, help me preach in here. You don't have a right to your own purpose. You don't have a right to your own desire. You don't have a right to your own preferences when you are a representative of the God that you serve. So your bad day is more than a bad day. Your bad day is a representation of your God to people who don't know him. All right. So, it is clear that as a son, I represent my God just as clear as it is that sons represent their fathers. And if you are a son of God and an apostolic believer, the integrity of your representation and your character matters. I must live like a son of God. I must greet people like a son of God. I must handle conflict like a son of God. I must love people like a son of God. And I've got to be willing to die to my flesh and the desires thereof to represent my father as his son. Your identity in sonship matters. And your integrity in sonship matters. And if who you are as a son is not secure in who you have as a father, then you're going to allow the devil to manipulate your identity gaps. All right, so... The reason I had to go the route of perspective, Mish. The reason I had to go from perspective to identity and from perspective to identity into sonship is because this month we've been dealing with prayer. And before I can ever talk to you about the power of intercession, one of the first things we've got to secure is your identity. Is because if you don't know you're a son, then your prayers are going to be offered up as an orphan. I don't have time to deal with that right there. But the thing you've got to understand about the power of real intercession intercession d4 is that the power of intercession don't fall on skill it falls on identity you can't go to god confidently and combat a demonic principality if you have questions about who you are in god you can't deal with a regional authority if you're still trying to figure out if you want to be saved if you want to go twerk if you want to go give your soul to buddha or if you want to go gamble down at the midnight casino you got to know who you are in god so when you stand in your intercessory responsibility when hell sends warfare your way your identity is not shaken by the warfare now because intercession is more than prayer and intercession is more than what happens over a mic you've got to understand that intercession is going to be uh, infiltrated in your prayer life and it's going to be also infected in your sonship and that's why sonship is bigger listen than gender and it helps you realize that everything you do begins and ends in sonship I pray as a son I serve as a son I lead as a son watch me you husband as a son you wife as a son I wish I had help you brother as a son you daughter as a son and if your identity is not a fix in your sonship first when those other areas of your life go awry what you're going to do is you're going to find a way to, uh, to, to get a hitch in your giddy up to deal with the problem and you're only going to deal with it through carnal means because you don't know how to deal with it as a son so, 
Everything I do must begin and end in sonship. And sonship is not my security clearance that allows me to do whatever I want in the kingdom. Sonship is my identity and my genetic gift that makes all that belongs to the Father belong to me. And if the earth is the Lord's, y'all don't even know, you almost lost me just saying, and the fullness thereof, then what belongs to the Father belongs to me. All right, so Romans chapter number 8. Don't worry, I'm coming to Second Chronicles in just a minute. I'm not going to hold this too much longer. But Romans chapter number 8, verse 14, 16, and 17 says this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are what? The children of God. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. That's why the creature is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God because when the creature get the sons it, the son manifests the father all right so let me move because I, I bored you long enough everything I do must be centered through my identity as a son because if I don't know who I am I cannot fulfill the depth of my call once I am secure in my sonship, I can boldly confront and stand secure in everything else that the Father has made me to be. Here's the truth of the matter. I, 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 and I say this gently, and I say this, I, I want to say it as gingerly as possible. I hope it comes across nice. I, don't wanna, I, I really don't care how many accurate prophecies you give if you don't know who you are as a son. I really don't care how many songs you write if you don't know who you are as a son I don't even care how many demons you cast out and we love deliverance ministry cough foam throw up do all of that great stuff but I don't really care how much of that happens until you know who you are as a son I actually don't even care how many records you sold how many runs you landed how much money you give to the church until you know who you are as a son let me tell you why because our age and our dispensation gets caught up in the fact that I perform that I perform that I perform that I function 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 and function function and performance and functionality is not the goal sonship is and Jesus said there will be many of you who will say Lord Lord didn't I prophesy in your name didn't I cast out devils in your name and what he's going to say is depart from me you worker of iniquity pause what I did I did in your name what I did I did for your glory what I did I did for your kingdom but what he's going to say is depart from me you worker of iniquity I never knew you why because only sons have the identity to support the functionality so the goal is not to function because I don't have to function to be a son when I left my father's loins I was his son if I never did anything else I didn't have to work to become a son I didn't have to strive to become a son I didn't have to labor to get his last name I didn't have to strive to get his DNA by the time I left him and entered into my mother and came out nine months later I was a son if he claimed me or not I'm a son if he was here or not I'm a son because I was born from him. But my sonship was established. Watch me. This is the part you really need to shout about. My sonship was established by the spirit of adoption. You don't know when to shout. I said my sonship was established by the spirit of adoption. And what that means is that the spirit of performance cannot infect or affect my confidence or my authority or my security. Why? Because if he adopted me, then he chose me. Misha, that's a dangerous spot. I'm about to run through that wall one more time. Because the reality of who I am when I wake up in the morning and take my first breath, if I speak in tongues or not if I pray or not if I fast or not if I roll on the floor or not if I wear a collar if I wear jeans if I wear J's if I wear wands if I wear elevens if I wear bordeaux it don't matter what you wear who I am as a son is secure because he chose me 
You don't know when this. I said he chose me. I said I said he chose I said he chose I said he chose me. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba Father. I'm coming to Second Chronicles in just a minute. But the reason, take a deep breath, the reason your prayer life sucks is because you don't know who you are as a son. I'm going to look down so you don't get offended with me. You wouldn't be afraid of rejection if you knew who you were as a son. You wouldn't be afraid of men's abandonment if you knew who you were as a son. What your mama didn't do, what your daddy didn't do, what your auntie didn't say, what your grandma didn't say wouldn't affect you if you knew who you were as a son of God I am a son I am a son. I am a son and he chose me. Let me deal with this for just a few moments. You could deal with your haters because and you know we live in an age where people preach about haters. You could deal with your haters if you knew who you were as a son. You could subdue your flesh if you knew who you were as a son. You could tell your ex no if you knew who you were as a son. I'm working in here. You could ignore a hate big head text if you knew who you were as a son. You could shut down your only fans account if you knew who you were as a son the basement of who I am and what I do it's not in my performance it's in my sonship all right and I needed to go this route of perspective to identity into sonship because let the church say if if we are going to turn the tide through prayer in the region and in the region in which we are established as a stronghold we can only do it under the umbrella of if my people are you tracking with me I'm not just making up stuff and moving along the way as I feel like it but before we can talk about if my people you've got to be established in the fact that you are his people you feel like your sin disqualifies you from being a son of God and the truth of the matter is elder he didn't discover your sin at the same time you did you just found out about your weakness five years ago you found out about your proclivity seven years ago and he knew it from the beginning of time so here you are allowing condemnation to make you hide from who you are as a son of God but none of that matters because he chose me watch me and he chose me with my weakness and I, I almost flipped he chose me with my flaw he chose me with my mistakes watch me he chose me with my choices oh cause the truth of the matter is some of the stuff I did was not a mistake some of the things I engaged was not an accident it wasn't the devil it was my plan it was my preference it was my fetish you quiet but I'm working in here anyway it was my choice but we're all that he knows about me after all he is El Roy he's the all seeing God he is omniscient he knows all things he still chose me all right he chose me he chose me he chose me and if we're going to navigate into the authority of 2 Chronicles chapter 7 on if my people who are called by my name, we've got to know that we are his people. Lay your hands on yourself. I know it's a little broken English. It's a little bitty bonnet. But say, I am his people. Israel is the nation of God born from the womb of his will. I'm coming to Second Chronicles in just a moment. I wish I had time, Shamari, to deal with what it looks like to be incubated in the womb of the will of God. You would be a lot more patient if you knew that what you carry needed to be incubated in a womb. You would be a little more patient if you knew that what you carried was bigger than what you desire in your heart right now. The reason God needs to conceal some of your purpose from you is because you can't really handle the fullness of your identity yet. So he needs to incubate it. It needs to germinate. It needs to be cultivated in the womb of his will. So Israel was a nation of people born from the womb of the will of God. 
And the truth of the matter is, is that Saul, at the request of the nation, becomes the first king. Now, I got to move through this history, but you have to understand it. You have to track with me. You have to journey with me through this historicity because it's going to help the text in 2 Chronicles 6. In 2 Chronicles 7, makes sense. Uh, so, 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 Israel is a nation born from the womb of the will of God. And by the time we discover Israel, they have been led by God. He is their only king. I almost flipped. He is their only king, but because they are afraid of the militaristic front of the age they live in, they desire, in a sense, to be like the other people, and they say, it's not enough for us to have judges. It's not enough for us to have prophets. It's not enough for us to have captains. We need a king. So God grants their request and he gives them a king and Saul becomes their first king and after Saul's rejection because of his disobedience, remember that Saul was rejected for disobedience. Remember that Saul was rejected for disobedience. So after his disobedience, he's rejected and David succeeds him as king. Let's talk about David, a strong man, a valiant man a mighty man of war, anointed as king while tending his father's sheep. And while there as a shepherd, he does something. I want to run. He does something, D4. He does something, Bryson. He combats a lion. He combats a bear. Not only so, but he also combats Goliath. I want to pause and put a little bit of pressure right here uh, because David was assigned as a shepherd uh, to the sheep so that he could learn how to steward God's people well. Listen to me because I'm about to tell you something you're going to need for the next 15 years. So he was divinely assigned to sheep to learn how to handle God's people. He was divinely assigned to a hungry bear and a hungry lion to train him on defending God's people from bloodthirsty enemies. Lay your hands on your chest and make this declaration. Say, read the season well. Now, I know you said that like this was a library on the other side of town, but I need you to say this like you know who you are. Lay your hands on your chest and scream. Read the season well. Now, let me tell you what you just intravenously came into contact with. David could have never looked at sheep and knew that God was training him to handle a kingdom based on how he handled sheep. And what you got to understand is that God will put you in one season, a concealed season, a blind season, a season you can't interpret, a season you don't understand, but the goal and the purpose and the reason is to train you for what's next. Lay hands on yourself one more time and say, read the season well. Who could have told David that when he was innocently defending his father's sheep against a lion and a bear, that he was preparing and training to deal with demons, devils, and principalities in another lifetime of his assignment? You got to read the season well, because if you're frustrated with where you are now, and if you're frustrated with what's in front of you now, and if you're jealous of somebody else around you, and if comparison grips how you see yourself, you're going to misread the season and feel like God keeps stricken you and God keeps tormenting you but you gotta learn how to read the season and read it well read the season well because every season he survived and, uh, in his present was a lesson for his future I'm going to say it again every season he survived in his present was a lesson for his future so by the time we get to Goliath this is now a king's lesson on how to deal with champions and opposers of the nations. You missed it. When he was dealing with the sheep, he was learning how to manage God's people. When he was dealing with lions and bears, he was learning how to deal with bloodthirsty enemies. But by the time God set him in front of Goliath, it was a, le a lesson on apostolicity on how to confront principalities and powers. You understand a war between gods and nations. That's why you've got to read the season well so simultaneously it is a lesson for you and I listen on the tactile responsibility of apostolic authority 
I'll say it one more time. As we read David's story, don't worry, I'm coming to 2 Chronicles, but before I get you to Solomon, I got to deal with David first. If you read the season well, and if you read David's life well, you're going to understand a tactile responsibility of apostolic authority on how to dismantle principalities. You ready? Take a deep breath. Goliath was not just Goliath. And you know you need to know when to shout because that was your praise point. Goliath was not just Goliath. He was not a lone giant. I want to scream right here. He was not an individual bullying Israel for his own accomplishment and his own gain. What Goliath represented, watch me, was a prince of a principality. I'm working in here. What he represents is a head that needs to be taken off and the only way God's going to deal with the head is if he assigns the right man to get the job done. Watch me. So when David dealt with Goliath, the first thing he did was he put a stone in his forehead, which is our lesson and watch me on confronting the seat of government of the principality watch me the way you deal with a principality is you deal with it by the stone what is the stone the rejected stone who is the rejected stone Jesus Christ so the way you deal with the head of a principality and a power is you injected with the rejected stone which is Jesus Christ that's the first thing we learn from David not only so but David does not only put a stone in the head of Goliath but David was not not just a little boy playing with a slingshot. God, I wish you would hear me. David was not a little boy elder playing with a slingshot. David was not out there with a slingshot because he wanted to knock cans off the fence. He wasn't trying to knock birds out of the air. But biblical history, continuity, and integrity help us to understand that in the Bible, especially in times of war, there was a group of people called the archers and then there was a group of people called the slingers. The archers were responsible for warfare by way of the arrow and the archers and, and, and and the slingers were responsible for war warfare by way of the slingshot. What you got to understand about David is David was not a child playing with a slingshot. David was a skilled archer. He was a man skilled in his craft. He knew exactly what he was doing. As a matter of fact, history tells us that he was able to throw a rock above 100 miles an hour in his sling because the archers and the slingers would go into battle last to deal with whatever enemies were left. I to the foot soldiers moved into war so David was not just playing with a sling and a rock watch me David used his skill in warfare David used his skill in warfare mm -mm. David listen to me he used his skill in warfare he, 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 he used his skill and I'm saying something on another level that I hope your spirit he used his skill in warfare and what you've got to understand is that while you want to speak in tongues through every battle while you want to prophesy through every battle some warfare is going to be accomplished on the level of your skill that's why you got to get a job because God can win more war through your job because the weapons of our warfare are not coming that's why you got to go back to school because God wants to put his hand on your skill that's why you got to get a train because God wants to put his hand on your skill and if you don't have a skill that God can breathe on all you're going to do is come in here speak in tongues wear pressure and no warfare is accomplished he used his skill he uses skill and what you just learned is that there is some warfare that is accomplished listen to me through your professional posture I said there is warfare that is accomplished through your professional posture. Listen to me. Sitting at home, fussing with your friends in a group chat about the political or front ain't gonna change and shut your mouth, get your butt up and go run for office. Why? Because he wants to put your, his hand on your professional posture. And until you put yourself in a space where your professionalism becomes warfare, then all you got is a sounding tongue. And it's not enough. He put his hand on his profession. He put his hand on his skill. And if you want to deal a blow to the kingdom of darkness, you've got to give God a skill to work with. 
as apostolic people, we are mountain conquerors. And our only warfare is not tongues and tallits. But our battle in a spiritual warfare can be accomplished when we represent apostolic authority in the mountain of our godly establishment. So everybody wants a mic. And everybody wants a collar. But nobody wants to be a truck driver and pray for the nations as you drive through the nation. I wish I had somebody that would think with me. I said he wants to put his hand on your skill. And you are offended with the labor of your natural use. As if God can take it and transform it and convert it. And use it for the purposes of the kingdom of God. What I'm saying to you is this. Listen to me. Being a prophet is not enough. You need to be trained and developed. That skill needs to be honed. That gift needs to be develop that craft needs to be enhanced because God wants to use your professional posture so not only was David a skilled slinger watch me he was trained taught informed and prepared it was not off the cuff it was not spontaneous it was holy spirit but it was holy spirit uh, inspired performance because he admitted, submitted himself to a system of education to learn the skill and then use it for god here's 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 i, I don't want to offend nobody I, that's not my goal my goal is to obey god if you get offended as a byproduct oh well but 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 liking to sing is not enough. You need a voice coach. Liking to dance ain't enough. I wish the church would hear me. You need somebody to instruct you on how to get better at what you do. And if you sit in pride and feel like you got it all together and don't go to nobody's seminar, don't go to nobody's session, I know you like to do graphics, but who have you submitted to because you'll see what you do and what you build and what you create through your own lens and you'll pat yourself on your back because you're proud of your progress, but progress ain't enough professionalism is. You got to to be more than proud of the progress you got to become a professional all right you want to be an apostle to the nations but you don't even have the disciplinary diet to sit through classes on justification sanctification glorification okay it, it, it is the doctrines of the church it, it, it's got to be more than plow and build it's got to be a long suffering it's got to be a skill it's got to be patience it's got to be the fact that Paul said as an apostle we are made spectacles to the world I don't want to know how well you do what you do and you pat yourself on the back because nobody else did it I want to know what system have you submitted to to enhance what God gave you not only so you got to understand that the sling wasn't a hobby. It was a finely tuned skill set. And when you submit that skill set to the spirit, you release yourself into the supernatural. Watch me. Not only so, he took Goliath's sword and he cut Goliath's head off. I'm coming to Solomon in just a moment. Don't rush me. He took Goliath's sword. He took his head off, and what that teaches us to do is to deal with the root, the strength, and the source of the issue at hand. He didn't cut off an arm. He didn't cut off a big toe. He didn't cut off his ankle. He didn't cut off an earlobe. He had to deal with the head, and the reason he had to deal with the head was because he had to deal with the source of the power and the influence. Watch me. Uh, I'm going to look at y'all because I don't think y'all going to be offended by this. The church people want to want to cast Beyonce out, and Beyonce ain't a spirit. You want to deal with what's on the surface. Oh, I'm working in here. You want to deal with the symptom, but you don't want to deal with the source, and in order to deal with the demonic principality you can't deal with what's on the surface you can't deal with the symptom you can't deal with what you see you got to deal with the watch me the source and the system you got to deal with what's up under there you got to deal with what's behind there and while all of us you want to cast out the spirit of Trey songs you want to cast out the spirit of Chris Brown leave them people alone and figure out what the source is behind it you want to deal with the person but our warfare is not against flesh and blood what you got to deal with it's the spirit of perversion that's the spirit behind the entity I know you want to deal with the person but that ain't where the power is that's only the affront that the agenda of hell uses to distract you because while y'all were busy fighting about Beyonce the body of Christ was falling apart in division because we had prophets fighting prophets 
I'll stand in my office and add more to it before I take it away. What you've got to deal with is the source. What you've got to do is deal with the system. you got to cut the head of Goliath off. Now, not only did David deal with the head of Goliath to deal with the strength of the power and the source and the system, but he also did as, watch me, to overturn the rebellion of a former season. No, see this. Watch me. Track with me and pay attention. He had to listen to me. He had to cut the head of Goliath off. He cut Goliath's head off. He, 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 he cut Goliath's head off. Son, he, he, he cut Goliath's head off. Why? Because the head is the seat of power. The head is the seat of influence. The head is the seat of functionality. And what he did by cutting Goliath's head off was make a prophetic gesture toward his responsibility as king in the next season. Somebody shout why. I said shout and you whispered shout why. Because when God told Saul to go and deal with the Amalekites, he told Saul to kill everything from the Amalekite camp. But Saul's rebellion and disobedience allowed Agag, the king, the head of the organization, the organism, the prince of the principality, he allowed the head to live. So the reason David had to cut Goliath's head off is because he had to make a prophetic declaration is we will repeat error again. We won't repeat the system era of the last season. He dealt apostolically with the head of Goliath. Because here's the thing. Even hell is aware that if you strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. But David was a smart man. It wasn't enough for him to put a rock in Goliath's head. He had to cut the head off because Goliath represented the figurehead of the Philistines. So by the time David dealt with Goliath, he dealt with more than Goliath. He ran the Philistines off from terrorizing and tormenting the house of Israel at large. All right. I'm moving. I got a lot more to say. Uh, but I'm going to skip because it's getting late. So... David deals with a lion. He defeats the lion. He deals with a bear. He defeats the bear. Oh, I already feel your spirit man is closing up on me. You don't even know where I'm going, but I'm telling you, your spirit man has a suspicion of the fact that I'm about to hit you in the back of your jaw and you're trying to close up on me, but I'm getting ready to come for you and you don't even know it. Stick with me though. He dealt with the lion. He conquered that. He dealt with the bear, he conquered that. He dealt with Goliath and he conquered that. And not only so, but Second Chronicles or, or First Chronicles 18, it gives us several other versions of David's warfare and how many battles he wants. He defeats the Philistines and he captures Gath. He defeats the Moabites and then he defeats the king of Zobah at Hamath. He even defeats the Amalekites after they come and burn Ziklag. But... There was one war that David lost. There was one battle that David lost. He handled the lion. He handled the bear. He handled Goliath, the Moabites. He, he handled all of the kingdoms. But the one war he did not win was the war of his will. He died on the altar of his lack of discipline. Because although he could deal with gods and nations, princes and principalities, kings and kingdoms, the one thing he couldn't overcome was his lust for Bathsheba. That's the one war that got him. Oh, I feel like preaching. Give me a little bit of time. That's the one war that conquered him the most. And it doesn't matter how many tongues you speak in. If you don't subdue your flesh, then your warfare is in vain. If you don't subdue your flesh, your floor pacing is in vain. If you don't subdue your flesh, your fasting is in vain. David dealt with every other type of warfare except the war of the inner man. Which means you can be successful championing the warfare of the body of Christ, but then go home and still wrestle with depression. Am I okay? It's like something got sucked out the room. 
you can deal with warfare at church on a spiritual affront, but then go home and pornography wear you out every night. You can deal with the fact that demons and devils are in the room and you scream, come out, and they're going to vomit on your shoes and come out on the floor and squirm and roll around on the altar. But then you get home and then talk to your mama and daddy in months. What I'm interested in talking to you about is the fact that David won every external war and the warfare on the outside wasn't the issue. It was the war internally that he had to deal with with why because that's the war that disqualified him from building God a house David had a good idea I feel like preaching and he was talking to Nathan listen to me prophets he was talking to Nathan the prophet and he said I want to build God a house because the ark of the covenant has not been in Jerusalem or in Israel since Saul was the king Nathan listen to me Nathan the prophet said to David he said do what is in your heart the Lord is with you that's what he told him but by the time it's, it's a lesson on prophetic integrity by the time Nathan got home he had a vision from God and Nathan had to go and retract his words and say I know that I told you that the Lord was with you but the Lord said I didn't ask you for this house he said, I didn't ask you to build me a house and you can't build it because of the amount of blood that is on your hands. And what he told him is, I'm going to give you a son that will build me a house and your son will erect the thing that you desire. I got to move forward. So the son that God gives to David was Solomon. David sees Bathsheba. He sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, has her husband killed. The child she's pregnant with dies. And, and if this is a, a different conversation, I would pause and deal with the fact that David was, was a us. Y'all know how he comforted that lady when she lost her baby? He got her pregnant again. That's just, we can't deal with that right now. He gets her pregnant again to deal with the fact that she just lost the baby. And this time the child lives and they name the child Solomon. I'm almost done. And it is Solomon that builds God this house. It is Solomon that dedicates this temple to the Lord. Solomon doesn't only build the house, but he dedicates it to God. Now, that's important because we got a lot of people performing and moving in good ideas, but they don't ever give it to God. And the truth of the matter is, is your T-shirt business is a good idea, but is that what God wants from you in this time, in this season? One of the things you got to understand about prophetic downloads is you may get the information in time, but eternity wants you to hold it for another 10 years. And you got to have the integrity and the stewardship to know I got it today, but it's not for right now. Solomon built the house that David seen. I want to run. Solomon built the house according to the specifications that David gave him. Solomon builds the house. Now, it is important theologically and it has to be theologically responsible of us to talk about the text at hand if my people who are called by my name but before we get to chapter 7 of 2nd Chronicles it would be irresponsible of us not to deal with chapter 6 I promise I'm almost done because before you get to chapter 7 you've got to stop at chapter 6 first Chapter 6 gives you context to what chapter 7 actually means. Outside of understanding what's going on in 2 Chronicles 6, all you get to chapter 7 and here is God being random saying, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, and that's preceded by if I shut up heaven and there be no rain. But before we get there, the, 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 the cry of if my people did not start at if my people. Listen to me. The cry of if my people started in if thy people. Mm -mm. Listen to what I just said. God's response in chapter 7 of if my people began with Solomon's prayer in chapter 6 of if thy people. The entire affront of what we get out of chapter 7 is because Solomon was an intercessor in chapter 6. Okay, let, let, let me move through this. A part of Solomon dedicating the temple was his desire to establish it as the venue of God's ear for Israel. He didn't just want the temple, listen to me, he didn't just want the temple to be beautiful. He wanted the temple to be functional. He didn't just want the temple to be beautiful. 
He wanted the temple to be functional. I'm going to say it again. He didn't just want the temple to be beautiful. He wanted the temple to be functional. The goal of the temple was not its beauty. The beauty of the temple was the expression of God's worth. The goal of the temple was to, it was to establish a house of prayer. Watch me. While Solomon was a man of wisdom and the temple was built in opulence, Solomon's most underrated skill was his commitment to prayer because the first lesson he teaches us out of 2 Chronicles chapter 6 is that prayer has to be more functional than beautiful. Now, 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 now I know you understand that and you think you got it together. And I, and, I, and I know you're a powerful intercessor. You're a powerful prayer warrior. You come out of your bed and you say, yeah, Jesus, and you're ready to walk. I, just, I got you. I know where you are. But what you got to understand is prayer has to be more functional than beautiful. We have got to be sure that prayer is not about how many tongues you can speak in. We've got to be sure that we don't pervert the power of prayer to how many prayer shawls you got and who you got it from. We've got to make sure that the power of prayer is not relegated to how many fancy words you can interject in the time and the moment that you pray. It's not about how good the band is. It's not about if you growl or grunt at the right moment because we have become so much more enamored with the theatrics of prayer. We have forsaken prayer and its functionality. Watch me. Because it's possible to move heaven with few words. Y'all about to lose me. It's possible to move heaven with a moan and a groan that cannot be uttered. It's possible to move heaven just by saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's possible to move heaven by saying, oh, Jesus. It's possible to get heaven involved and you don't have a lexicon of fancy terms. We've got to redeem the purity of prayer. That's, uh, that's good. Stick with me, elder. What we've got is a group of people who call themselves intercessors, but what they are is professional corporate prayer leaders because prayer is only beautiful because when they have the mic in they, their hand, they know how to move into the skill of corporate prayer leadership. But they're not real intercessors because they don't take the burden home once they give the mic up. The first thing, watch me, that Solomon did in the temple was he made a sacrifice. And he didn't just make a general sacrifice. Watch me. He killed 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. Now, historically, every family would bring two animals. So we're looking at uh, numerically over 250,000 animals to be sacrificed. The first day of the opening of the dedicated temple was a bloodbath. And I'm afraid that we have intercessors, men and women who like to be on flyers, but they don't know what it's like to engage in the blood of prayer. I got five more points to give you, but I may not get to it tonight. You've got to know as an intercessor when it's time to get dirty. You've got to, okay, I'm about to mess up. You've got to know that just because you bump into information in prayer, that's not your license to run your mouth about what you sense, what you seen, what you deserve. That's how I know some of y'all are intercessors because you run your mouth too much. You feel like you got to tell everybody everything you've seen because you won't credit just in case it comes out you want somebody to have a record that you said it first before you ever deal with the fact that I call my prayer partner about my vision I went to God and I dealt with that thing in blood let me teach you how to pray for your pastor real quick if you praying for your leaders and you discover something in prayer that you don't have natural knowledge about shut your mouth and deal with that thing in your closet they don't like this because they want to get on Facebook and issue rebukes to people and you don't even have a rank authority or weight to issue the rebuke behind the words that you're giving. I want to know how many intercessors know how to deal with blood in prayer. I want to know how many intercessors know how to deal with deficits in prayer. I don't want to know what you sound like across a mic. I want to know what you sound like in your closet. I don't want to know what you sound like when the band is going. I want to know what you sound like on your face.
face. I don't want to know what you sound like when the room is filled with people. I want to know what you sound like when you run out of words. After all, the power of the Holy Ghost makes intercession through moanings and groanings that cannot be uttered. And there's some things I won't even allow my lips to utter. But when I get in the place of prayer, all I've got is an oh, oh, oh. Prayer has to be functional and not just beautiful. I feel a wheel turning in the spirit. We're going to move in this in just a moment. It is easy for an intercessor to discover information in prayer. But listen to me, intercessors, because I told you I came to put my hand and stretch this intercessory matrix. Information is not the goal of intercession. The establishment of the will of God is. So if the only thing you come out of intercession with is information, you're nosy. You're a gossiper, and you just want to spread people's business. But if you don't know how to interject and interpose yourself between the desire of God and the deficit of earth, it ain't intercession until you can look and say this person is battling with suicide and I'm not going to talk about it to my friends and tell them what I see and I sense just so I can add to my prophetic acuity I'm getting ready to wrestle and labor and wrestle and labor and wrestle and labor and wrestle and labor and wrestle and labor labor. you don't have to know my name but if I pass by you in the store I'm not impressed with my word of knowledge just because I picked up the season of your soul I'm going to wrestle till you get your mind back I'm gonna fight till you get your sanity back prayer has to be functional and not just beautiful so he teaches us that prayer has to be functional and not beautiful Solomon teaches us that prayer must have an agenda. I'm almost done. The agenda of Solomon's prayer is revealed, watch me, because he ascended to the place of prayer. 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 Prayer had a place. It wasn't only a posture, but he had a space that was dedicated to prayer. Take a deep breath because I've got a rebuke for you. You too grown to be getting away with shower prayers and feel like your intercessory responsibility is accomplished. You too grown to feel like the only time you have prayer time is on your drive to work. You need to carve out and dedicate a time where you give God your agenda where you set aside your time to pray I lift your hands I pray in the name of Jesus that conviction comes on your prayer life tonight and where you've been giving up your responsibility I'm done preaching I feel a wheel turning in the room where you've given up your responsibility where you've given up your posture in prayer where you've given up your ascent in prayer that you get your ascent back get to your feet get to your knees get on your face conviction is coming back prayerlessness is a sin and the season we are in we cannot afford to go silent i need you to take 60 seconds open up your mouth and fill this room with the fragrance of prayer come on come on you gotta ascend tonight a sin I had three more points but I feel a prayer wheel turning I need you to cry out of your belly tonight the text said if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray that God would end up forgiving sins and healing the land the responsibility of intercession is on you the if is in your hands the ball is in your court what happens is on your shoulders I want you to cry out tonight like an intercessor come on come on intercessor cry out come on intercessor cry out Come on, I feel a prayer wheel turning. I feel conviction coming on your prayer life. 
Some of you need to posture yourselves to get your cry back. Some of you need to posture yourselves to get your lament back. Some of you need to posture yourselves to get your travail back. You got lazy in prayer. You got comfortable in prayer. You came off the wall. You got intimidated by your assignment. But we're responsible for the region and we won't stop praying. Come on, open up your mouth. Yeah, yeah, yes. What God told Solomon is that when my people pray, I'll turn the reins of the region where it should have been desolation, where it should have been destruction, where it should have been defeat. I'm going to turn it because you pray. I just told you that God is going to change his mind and change his decision because you prayed. What the text says was if I shut up heaven and if I release locusts and if I send pestilence, all of these were the decisions of God. But the posture of the intercessor can get God to change and repeal his decision. You're responsible. Oh, oh, you're responsible. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Labor, 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 labor destiny. Come on. Cry out for Richmond. Cry out for Richmond. Cry out for Richmond. What have you seen that needs to change? What have you seen that needs to turn? What have you seen that grieves the heart of God? One of the powers of the intercessor is we've got a pulse on the moods of God and we know when he's grieved what's been grieving the heart of God. Oh, come on, cry. I need a couple of you intercessors to get out of your seat and start pacing this floor. Come on, let's move now. Tonight we've got to reclaim Richmond. Tonight we've got to reclaim Virginia. Tonight we've got to reclaim the East Coast. Pray. 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 Pull yourself out of your English. Pull yourself out of your comfort. Come on. Come on, come on, cry out. I'm waiting for you to change the temperature of this room. Come on. A little bit further. A little bit further. A little bit further. Come on, destiny. Come on, destiny. We can't affect the globe if we can't change our region. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it. That's it. Come on. Keep walking and keep pacing. Move like you're walking across the city. Move like you're walking across this state. That's it, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Our assignment is bigger than destiny. Our assignment is bigger than this bill. Oh, I see a wheel. 
I see a wheel. I see a wheel. Come on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get on day. Asatab. Bereredushai ando de. Levedo. Rebenanda. Sopata. Giso. Perro. De levenin de le cosalabaya. Yap, yap, yap. So. Yema. Rindo. Lebeko. Aha. Come on. Some of you, this region forgot what you sound like. This region forgot what you sound like. You need to reestablish your voice in the city. Come on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, push. 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 Push! That's it. We're going to pray together in a minute, but I need you to keep pushing. Come on. Come on. Further. We ain't there yet. Further. Further. Get your stamina back. Get your wind back. Get your endurance back further. Apostle taught you how to labor. This is the time you put it in use. Come on, labor. Further. 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 Your footsteps are intercession. Your hand claps are intercession. Your voice is intercession. We're almost done. You like this? In the Lord, yep, yep, that's it. Misha, get a flag in your hand. Essence, get a flag in your hand. Start waving it in the air. The first place we're about to take is the territory of the air. Gird up your loins. Put on your strength. Come on, Zion. It's time to pray. Father, in the glorious name of Jesus, we reclaim and we repossess the authority and the atmosphere of Richmond. Yes, even the airspace. Yes, even the air rights. Yes, even the territory in the heavenlies, in the celestial. We reclaim it now. In every demonic vulture, every demonic raven huh, trying to claim the territory huh, every demonic stalker huh, trying to control the region huh, by way of the air huh, we reclaim it tonight we purify the air huh, we sanitize the air huh, yes huh, hell huh, has a principality huh, in the power of the air huh, but our God huh, is Adonai huh, he controls the air huh, he controls the earth huh, the heavens and the earth belong to him huh, and tonight, we reclaim the air. Oh, come on. I know that's not all you got. The air. The air. The kingdom of the air. We encroach upon the darkness in the air. What moves by way of television? Come on. What moves by way of radio and radio signals? Every demonic authority by way of radio waves, airwaves, signals in the heavens. We reclaim it now and we sanitize the air. A little bit further. A little bit further. Come on. A little bit further. Claim that air space. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. And tonight, in the glorious name of Jesus, oh, my, oh yeah, come on, push me, push me, push me. We confront the wickedness in high places. We confront the wickedness, their thrones, their kingdoms, their dominions, their edicts, their rules, their judgments, their devils, their spheres, their crowns. We confront you and we tear you down further, 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 further. We stand in the political climate of Richmond and we declare that the powers of hell don't decide elections, that the powers of hell don't decide who will sit in office. We claim the air. 30 seconds, open up your mouth and pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, let's go. We got two more places to go. If you're an intercessor, obey me. Start stomping on the ground. Come on, just start walking and stomping. Let's go. The ground, the ground, the ground, or not. Well, come on. I feel a principality about to fall. All witchcraft in the ground. All buried bones, buried blood, buried amulets. We confront you now. We uproot your power. I'm declaring in the name of Jesus that all demonic territory established in the terra firma, established in the dirt and the soil and even the tectonic plates we reclaim you now. The earth, the earth is the Lord's. 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 Your tire keeps stomping. Keep claim this ground. Claim the ground. And every demonic principality. I feel this. Push me one more time. Every demonic principality trying to keep Destiny Global Church from winning warfare in the ground. I command now in the name of Jesus, loose our property, loose our building, loose our land, loose our space. You demons functioning in dirt. You demons functioning in the soil. You demons occupying the ground, occupying construction. Occupy concrete. We confront you. We bind you. And we censor your power. 30 seconds. Open up your mouth and shout. I said open your mouth and shout. Oh, stop, I said, stop. We tread tonight. We tread tonight. We tread tonight. On serpent, Sadad, Pata, Tebe, Saba, Kishe, Keldo, Sata, Rifa, Pato, Sa, 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 Sa. Against serpents and scorpions. Come on, tread tonight. Yeah, come on. We got one more place to go and then I'm done. Oh, come on, destiny. Come on, destiny. Come on, destiny. This is how we wage war. 
This is how we wage war. This is how we win wars. That's it. That's it. That's it. Come on. I need you one more time. Just start stomping around the room. Come on. Listen, start stomping around this room. Stomp until Richmond starts shaking. We're almost there. Come on, press. 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 That's it. We got one more kingdom and then I'm done. Father, in the name of Jesus, we confront the kingdom of the water. Every mermaid spirit, every maritime devil, every spirit of the siren trying to lure the region called Richmond into its trap, into its demonic clutches. We confront the witchcraft on the water, water witching, sea witching, every demonic force trying to speak by way of the water, every occult spirit trying to control the region by way of the water. We confront you tonight. Oh, come on. Come on. Purify that water. Purify that water. We pour salt in contaminated water. We pour salt in contaminated water. We pour salt in contaminated water. And we cry, purify. Purify, purify. Oh yeah. Oh come on, push. Oh come on. A little while longer, we're almost there. Every spirit of the occult operating through the tentacles of an octopus. I pull out, I snatch out all eight of your tentacles. I declare war pop, sa, 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 sa. All white magic, yellow magic, black magic, red magic, all witchcraft by the water, all mirror gazing, all tea leaf blowing, all crystal ball gazing. I command your power and your authority to be broken now. I bind your voice. I bind your voice. I bind your influence. Influence in education. Influence in finance. Influence in government. We take back the waterways. Oh, one more time. Every spirit, every foreign devil, every foreign occupant that has come by way of demonic espionage from another country, from another realm, from another principality, we censor you at the border. We censor you at the border. We censor you at the border. Now I want you to open up your mouth and shout in this room. Oh, that's weak. Open up your mouth and shout. Shout, 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 shout. Yellow sweater, come here. Come to the altar. Lift your hands. Hell wanted you to live out the curse of men in your family.
from the time you got married and before there were people speaking against your union you walked to this altar and I heard the word curses of of men and women in your family I'm looking at a particular aunt who had some negative words and darts and daggers against you and your soul made a covenant with the words that she spoke but I'm declaring in the name of Jesus that the authority of that word curse is being uprooted out of your belly right now. Shamari, come here, son. Lay your hands on him. I'm declaring right now that that word curse is destroyed and uprooted right now from your blood, from your bloodline, out of your DNA, out of your destiny. The fear of failing as a husband. Oh, what is this? Uh, even the fear of failing as a father. I'm declaring in the name. Oh, yes. Uh, and the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear that is partnered with the spirit of torment. I'm declaring in the name of Jesus that the spirit of torment, oh, the spirit of torment that wants to assail you and your purpose and your destiny. I'm declaring in the name of Jesus that his voice is silent. You got 30 seconds, church, praying the Holy Ghost. God's redeeming a storyline. Come on. Oh, I said God's redeeming a storyline, church. Come on. I didn't come as a prophet tonight. I came apostolically to confront seated powers. God's redeeming storylines. Come on, labor. Now you foul spirit of torment trying to control this man's ear gate. I command you in the name of Jesus to loose your hole. We sever, we break, and we destroy your power now. I command you in the name of Jesus. You foul spirit of torment, come out now in Jesus' name. Out. I command you from the root, from his daddy's devils. I command you every spirit of abandonment, every spirit of rejection trying to control this man. I command you come out by the root now. Come on, labor church, labor, labor, labor. the vagabond spirit I command you to let him go now you found covenant to poverty and impoverished living I command you now to loose him from the root out oh come on labor 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 get your son Come on, out, 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 out. I command you right now, let this man go. Let his bloodline go. Let his DNA go. Let his history go. Let his call go. Let his purpose go. Let his identity go. Or would y'all help him fight? There's a spirit of torment that's been following you since you were the age of seven years old. But I'm declaring tonight in the name of Jesus that the authority of torment is broken now. I bind torment. I bind torment. False guilt, false guilt, shame, and even condemnation. I command it to be broken now. Somebody open your mouth and shout. Come up. Come up. Come up. Come up out of there. Out. Out. Come out of there. Lay your hands on his belly, Shamari. I said in the name of Jesus, I command you, come out. of re 
repeated cycles, fear of repeated storylines. I command you now, let him go. The orphan curse, oh I know you. The orphan curse, the orphan curse. I know you by name and you know me by authority. I command the curse, turn him back over. I command the curse, turn him back over. I command the curse of the orphan to be broken. Cut out now in the name of Jesus. Bastard spirit, I command you, come out. Oh, come on, church. I command it to be broken now in Jesus' name. This covenant to abandonment, this covenant to rejection, I command it to be severed. 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 We sever your tie. Come on, Bryson, labor, 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 labor. I called your mind back. Lay your hands on your on his head, son. I call your mind back. I call your mind back. I call your mind back. And every foul spirit of suicide trying to sneak its way into your soul. I come, oh yeah, oh yeah. The devil wanted you to flee from a season of settling. But I declare in the name of Jesus, this is your settlement season. This is your settling season. Pastor Martis, lay your hands on his feet. I declare in the name of Jesus, this is the season where God settles you. Oh no, Jonah. Oh no, Jonah. You won't run no more. Fear of failure. Fear of responsibility. I command you now, lose your hope. I need this church to go up and praise. Come on, open up your mouth. Bring me that oil. Isaiah, stand over here. Essence, stand over here. Yeah, go over there. Grab hands. Bryson. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost church. responsibility is being dispensed to you right now. Oh, wait a minute. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. is dispensing new authority. I feel like heaven is dispensing new responsibility. Come on, we're almost done. Push. 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 a brand new weight on you to comprehend the season that this house is in the measure of your intercession has need to increase I'm declaring in the name of Jesus you come out of hiding come out of a 
hidden season. Come out of a bastard season and stand in your responsibility. Don't you fall out. Hold her up. Stand. Stand. Carry the weight. Carry the weight. Carry the weight. Carry this weight. Because there's a devil that's been eating on your worst. There's been a, de a demonic locust from hell trying to tell you that you can't carry the weight of the call of the house. So you've been trying to run and hide, but you're gonna carry the weight. More, 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 more weight, more weight. Don't let up God. Well, come on, 30 seconds, open your mouth and cry out. I loosen the weight on you. Weight. It are so. All right, I got to go now. I'm about to start drifting. Lift your hands, Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. The Spirit of the Lord. Whoa. For fear of rejection, you have rejected the call of God. For fear of mismanagement, you have silenced the voice of the, of the Lord in your ear. You're gifted, you're anointed, we see it, we understand it, but it's not at the level of your mandate. And this is not a thing that belongs to you individually, for I'm standing at a line of men in your family that fear responsibility, that cannot handle the weight of responsibility. But the Lord stationed you in this house to change the narrative. For it had been hell's desire, lift your hands high, to be a man that aborts destiny and a man that aborts purpose. Yes, even a man that aborts ingenuity and creativity. For it is a desire of heaven to establish your name in, in multiple mountains. I don't know why the Lord is taking me into the sphere and the realm of technology. And it's as if the Lord wants to establish you with a witty invention in that world. But your fear of responsibility, your fear, uh, your rejection of responsibility for fear of failing and being a failure has shut your ear to the ingenuity of God. It is even in this house that you are called to carry more. And your hands have been relaxed by reason of an excuse. Now, I, I don't know this by knowledge, but what I'm sensing is that there are multiple layers of excuse keeping you out of your responsibility and your posture to this house. But tonight, in the name of Jesus, your shoulders are about to get heavier. Your weight is about to get denser. Your volume and your mass will increase. For these are the days that you express your sonship to this house. Lift your hands high. Pray in the Holy Ghost Church. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Uh, new oil. For I will bring you, saith the Lord your God, into a crushing season. A season that will crush your identity and that will crush your security and even crush your comfort because I desire to make of you a man of wisdom. Yes, even a man that utters with prophetic accuracy in every room he walks into. And tonight I sever and destroy your covenant with the spirit of fear. And I'm declaring in the name of Jesus, oh yes, that these are days of new identity for you.
May this day be the day of burning. May this day be a day of marking where the Lord marks you with his fire. I want you to raise up that sound, Elder. Come on, church, labor for a second. Woo, a burning one. A burning one. Ah, a burning one. Yeah, a burning one. A burning one. Oh, 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 oh. I call for the coals of heaven to come and burn his lips. Ah, the coals of heaven to burn. Ah, the coals of heaven. Ow, to burn, 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 burn. burn. A burning one, a burning one, a burning one. I snap the yoke of your own opinion and I push you, I launch you into a season of divine identity as a burning one. seconds pray in the Holy Ghost Church. Come on. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. Fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Never burn out. Never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Never burn out. Never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Fire on my altar never burn out. Father, we've done what you've commanded us to do. I give you praise, Jesus, that you have stretched the capacity of our intercessory call. Thank you that you've stretched the capacity of our womb. Father, we commit to our responsibility to this region. Change the way we see ourselves so that we can possess the mountains and the gates. In the glorious name of Jesus, if you accept your responsibility to this region, would you open up your mouth and shout one time? All right, here's what I need you to do. I know it's late. We're moving. I need everybody to get a seat in your hand. I need at least five of you to obey God with a seat of $50 tonight. You may not have come prepared to give it, may not have desired, may not have thought you wanted to or were willing to, but I need five of you to obey God with a $50 seat tonight. I want to stretch it. This is no gimmick. Y'all know I'm family family. So we ain't cut no deal. Say so if you raise this much, we'll give it to you. We, we None of that. I just want you to obey God tonight. If you're one of those five, just wave at me. I want to know where you are. I see you. I see you. If you're one of those five, I want you to wave at me. If you say, I don't have that 50 by myself, get with somebody else and give 25. You get, I see you. You give 25. Somebody else give 25. Y'all give 50 together. But everybody giving something tonight. We got to go. Once you're ready to give, if you have cash, bring it to the altar. If you're giving electronically, I believe our giving options are on our screen. 
want everybody giving something tonight. Once you've given, raise that phone in the air. All right, Father, I give you praise for every person that is giving, that is in this room and watching online. May this seed abound to their account. May it produce unprecedented harvests. And I thank you, oh, I feel this. I'm going to make a declaration and you respond in praise to the volume of your belief. I'm declaring that every person that is giving tonight under this intercessory if, this responsibility of the region, I give you praise that my God, you are raising up intercessors on their behalf that what they cannot do and accomplish on their own, there's an intercessor somewhere crying out for the favor of God to overwhelm their life. I declare that it is so, and so it is in Jesus' name. If you believe that God is raising up an intercessor, one that won't get tired, one that won't get weary, one that won't be overwhelmed, I want you to open up your mouth and shout in this room. You've already received our announcements. We give you love from our apostles. God bless you. Go in peace and serve the Lord in Jesus' name.